The mathematical concept of a permutation refers to the reordering of objects in an ordered set. Not exactly like this, but we'll get to the formalities soon enough. The word derives from the Latin verb mutare, to change, preceded by prefix per, meaning very or thoroughly, jointly translating as to exchange or to rearrange. The most thorough kind of permutation, where things get fully rearranged, is also known as a derangement, a permutation taken to the extreme. Derangements, and specifically how to count them, will be the main topic of this video. But let's start by counting all permutations, which is a lot easier. Here we have three colored cylinders, arranged in a row from left to right, in some particular order. If two cylinders are swapped, mathematically called a transposition, the order changes. We can keep swapping until all possible arrangements have appeared exactly once, revealing six possible orders of a set of three elements. But how can we be sure we've counted them all? With three elements, it's not too hard to convince yourself that this is indeed a complete list of all possible permutations of three objects. But for arbitrary set size n, we need a more systematic way of counting. The total number of permutations for set size n will be denoted by p sub n. For a set containing one single element, there's nothing much to permute, so p1 equals 1. Adding a second element presents a choice, to place it either before or after the first element, yielding two distinct permutations for n is 2. Writing it as 1 times 2 emphasizes that these two choices derive from the one distinct permutation for n is 1. Proceeding from here, there are three choices for adding a third element. To the left, in the middle, or to the right of the first two elements. So p3 equals 6. And the same logic applies for each next element. So to count permutations, simply multiply all the integers from 1 up to n. The operation known as n factorial. n factorial can also be recursively defined as the number of permutations for n minus 1 elements times n. The concept of a derangement may be introduced through a math classic, coined over 300 years ago by a French mathematician who will shortly make a more prominent appearance in this video. It's most often referred to as the old hats problem, or the hat check problem, describing a scene in a theater or a restaurant where the guests check in their hats before the event and come to retrieve it afterwards. However, due to some dramatic system failure, the hats are returned to the guests totally at random. Of course, they might still all miraculously retrieve their own hat, but unless the number of guests is very small, the probability of this happening is minute, 1 over n factorial. It's far more likely that at least some of them will go home with somebody else's hat. In this example, 2 out of 5 guests are lucky enough to end up with their own hats. But in the worst case scenario, all of the hats can be misplaced. And this is what defines a derangement, a permutation for which none of the elements in the set retain their original position. To find the odds of this happening for an arbitrary number of guests is the challenge of the hat check problem, end of this video, and it's by no means as trivial as it might look at first sight. An anagram is the equivalent of a permutation in natural language. The letters of the word triangle can be rearranged to form integral, which is therefore an anagram of triangle. Some hidden connection, maybe? Here's another one, again recycling all the original letters. Yes, these words are valid anagrams and permutations of triangle. What about the derangement property? In integral, all the letters have moved to a new position, so this is indeed a derangement. Relating, however, has an A on the fourth position, just as triangle does, so relating is not a derangement. The original word triangle doesn't count as an anagram, but it's still a permutation, even a special one, called the identity permutation, where the order is left unchanged which makes it the complete opposite of a derangement. Of course, you can make all sorts of gibberish permutations, which don't qualify as anagrams because they lack meaning. This one also happens to be a derangement. One more practical application of permutations, also known as Secret Santa. You may know the ritual, where all participants get to put paper notes with their names into a hat or whatever. After that, every participant draws one paper note at random, and is expected to buy a gift for the person they've drawn, without the recipient knowing the identity of the benefactor. If properly organized, the redistribution of the names among the participants can be viewed as a random permutation. 
Of course, it's crucial that nobody picks his own name from the hat, because buying a present for oneself violates the code of secrecy and isn't much fun anyway. The probability of a successful draw is therefore mathematically equivalent to the probability that a random permutation is a derangement. Note that the interpretation of the outcome is context bound. For Secret Santa, a derangement is a good thing. For the old hats problem, it's the worst case scenario. So, to sum up the premise, a derangement is a special kind of permutation, but we'd like to find out how special exactly. That is, if you throw an arrow at the permutations, where every one of them has an equal probability of getting hit, what are the odds that it will land within the derangement area? The number of permutations for given n has already been counted. Let's call the number of derangements d sub n, which is often written as the subfactorial of n. The fraction of derangements among all permutations for given n, or equivalently, the probability that a randomly chosen permutation is a derangement, shall be denoted by lowercase d sub n, and it's equal to dn divided by pn. The French mathematician mentioned earlier, who deserves credit for being the first to raise and eventually solve the question of counting derangements, is Pierre Raymond de Montmore. He had a keen interest in probability and games of chance. The matter of counting derangements arose naturally in the game of treize he invented, which involved shuffling the 13 distinct playing cards and comparing them against their original position in the deck. In 1713 he wrote the book, or actually the second edition of the book, Essai d'analyse sur les jeux d'hasard, in which, amongst other things, he presented the solution to the derangements counting problem. The inclusion-exclusion principle is a technique the Montmore might have used to this end, but he couldn't, because it hadn't yet been invented in his age. Today, many treatises on the subject do utilize this principle, because it offers an elegant and effective solution to the problem. However, it does involve abstract concepts in set theory, that can only be properly visualized in a high-dimensional space for all but the smallest set sizes. We won't go down that road here, but instead aim for a more practical, intuitive approach. To guide the intuition, a permutation will be represented by a directed graph, with vertices containing the elements and edges representing the displacement of the elements. The arrows map the elements in the original ordering to the position they will move to after the permutation. Here's another way to permute a five element set. And then C and D could map into themselves, but this way we won't get a derangement. So, to count derangements only, closed loops on a single vertex are to be avoided. From here on, a sequence of letters like this one will denote a derangement, relative to the original alphabetic ordering of the set. In search of a pattern, let's cover a number of small cases, starting with n is 1. A trivial affair, permitting only a closed loop. So d1 is 0. A set of one element cannot have a derangement. NS2 is rather trivial as well, for the only possibility is for A and B to map into each other. So D2 equals 1. NS3 then. If A chooses B, then B cannot choose A, for that would force a closed loop at C. Therefore, B must choose C, and C chooses A. Of course, A can also choose C, by which the cycle changes direction. And that's all there is. A closed loop visiting n vertices is called an n cycle, so these are both three cycles. That makes two derangements for n is 3. Triviality is rapidly fading away as we proceed to n is 4. Starting from a, we'll first explore the route to b. From b, there are two alternatives, both yielding one possible path. Going from a to d instead of b yields two more paths, which are the mirror images of the previous ones. And then we need to pick up two similar paths in the middle. That's all there is, right? No, it's not. And here's what makes counting derangements so much more difficult than counting permutations. So far, only four cycles were considered. But for NS4, it's also possible to construct two separate two cycles. Since A can form a pair with B, C, or D, this gives rise to another three distinct derangements. All of this for a grand total of 90 arrangements for n is 4, which is a big step up from the set sizes up to 3. What's the pattern here, if any? For larger n it becomes exceedingly tedious and unfeasible to keep on counting by hand, so it's time for a smarter strategy. 
Upon adding a fifth element, it's helpful to focus on connections to this new element only. It might form a pair or a two cycle with one of the other elements, for instance with A. An important insight at this point is that the problem of counting the arrangements within the subset containing B, C and D has already been solved and labeled as D3, the number of the arrangements of a three element set. So the two cycle EA contributes D3 derangements to the grand total for D5. But of course, E can form two cycles with any of the four existing elements. Therefore, two cycles containing the new element E contribute a total of four times D3 derangements. The next thing to consider would be three cycles with the new element. The two excluded elements then form a subset with D2 possible derangements. How many of these three cycles are there? This can be modeled by a tree rooted at E, branching into the available vertices at every stage. Note that the drawn configuration actually covers two of these three cycles, since three cycles can have two distinct orientations. All the other possibilities are represented by alternative paths down this tree, for a total of four times three possible three cycles containing E. This equals the number of ways to construct two element permutations from a set of four. And 4 is of course 5 minus 1, all elements except the newly added one. An alternative notation for this is 4p2, 4 permute 2. So 3 cycles with E contribute 4 times 3 times D2 to the derangement count for N is 5, D2 being the number of possible derangements of the remaining two elements, which is actually 1. The same pattern can now be extended to 4 cycles with E. There are 4 permute 3 of them or 4 times 3 times 2. Now d1 appears in the expression. But this is 0, so this whole term could be dropped. But let's not, because the general pattern is what we're after, and this term is definitely part of it. Finally, E can be part of a set-spanning 5 cycle, of which there are 4 permute 4, or simply 4 factorial. Again, we can formally add a factor d0, which now stands for the number of derangements in an empty set. A seemingly absurd proposition, but by defining d0 equals 1, the formalism remains logically consistent. Now the previously computed values can be plugged in to obtain d5, which turns out to be 44. Let's pause for a moment and have a look at what we've found so far. The permutation and derangement counts up to n is 5, as established. Now let's add a column for lowercase d sub n, the proportion of derangements relative to all permutations for given n, which is also the probability that a randomly chosen permutation is a derangement. A striking pattern emerges. The differences of consecutive probability values have alternating signs and apparently tend to zero while the n stabilizes around a certain value, rather than increasing or decreasing forever, perhaps contrary to intuition. But then again, maybe this shouldn't come as a huge surprise either, because the probability for a particular element to map to its original position decreases as the number of elements increases, and the probability that a random permutation is not a derangement can be roughly associated with the product of these two entities. So these two effects might cancel out to some extent. Anyway, on with the story. The next step will be to try and generalize the counting scheme found for n is 5 to arbitrary n. As for n is 5, only cycles involving the most recently added element will be counted explicitly. The arrangement counts in subsets of excluded elements are assumed to be known. Now it's a matter of finding expressions for the contributions of all possible cycles containing a n, the new element. Starting with two cycles, which a n can form with any of the previous elements. So that's n minus 1 possible two cycles times dn minus 2, the derangement count within the excluded subsets. Same thing for three cycles, of which there are n minus 1 times n minus 2, while the excluded subsets now contribute dn minus 3 derangements each. And so on and so forth. Up till the last term, representing all set-spanning cycles. A general expression can be given for the number of i cycles containing a n. A n itself is fixed, so the remaining choices can be expressed as n minus 1 permute i minus 1. Using this definition, the counts can be rewritten in the following way, after which they can be summed. To obtain the derangement fraction, denoted by lowercase dn, divide this expression by pn, or n factorial. 
rendering the following tidy result, which can be tidied even further by changing the summation index. To end up with a surprisingly concise equation, defining the n almost as the average of all previous terms up to the penultimate one. Now, starting from here with a clean sheet, the challenge is to find an explicit formula for the n. Which way to go? First of all, the summation is a major inconvenience, so let's move n out of the way, and then isolate the final term from the sum, leaving a summation that can be plugged back into the previous line, so that the sum in the bottom line can be replaced by a single d term. To yield the following second order difference equation. This equation can be regrouped to bring out differences of consecutive d terms. Let's name this difference delta sub n, by which the order of the difference equation reduces to 1. Note the similarity to the recursive formula for n factorial, with two discrepancies. The n minus 1th term is divided rather than multiplied by n, and there's an additional minus sign. So the explicit formula for delta n will be something over n factorial. Filling in the dots requires knowledge of the initial value of the sequence. Let's make a small table to this end and plug in some known values. Delta 2 equals d2 minus d1, and that's one half. To find delta 1, insert one more row to learn. Eventually, that delta 1 equals minus 1, which of course didn't really require the extra row, but it's always nice to reinforce the overall consistency. The minus sign in the equation will produce alternating signs of consecutive terms. So the explicit expression for delta n can now be revealed. It's minus 1 to the nth divided by n factorial. The intermediate variable delta n has done its job. Time to return to the body of interest, dn, which presents the next recursive equation to solve. But this is a simple one. Just sum out all the terms and plug in d naught, which equals 1. So here we are. Let's take a moment to enjoy the view. It's not surprising that the n appears to converge to a stable value as n goes to infinity, for the sum's terms are divided by k factorial, a faster than exponentially rising function, while the numerator always has an absolute value of 1. For some of you it may seem like this next formula is falling from the sky, but for a seasoned mathematician, the obtained result is instantly reminiscent of the famous power series for e to the x. A Taylor series, to be precise. Or a Maclaurin series, to be even more precise, because the series is developed around x is zero, a topic in itself that shall remain untouched here. It's noteworthy that both Taylor and Maclaurin were contemporaries of Pierre-Raymond de Montmore. In fact, the introduction of these series came after the Momor's work on the arrangements, so he was unable to fully exploit the connection to this body of theory. But to show that this series does make sense, here's a quick plot of the partial sums up to n is 12. As you can see, for increasing n it's getting better and better at approximating e to the x around x is zero. Beyond a certain point, it starts to diverge wildly. But the interval for which the approximation is valid can be extended arbitrarily far in both directions by summing a sufficient amount of terms. Now back to the derangements result. The terms being summed here match those of the e to the x series exactly if x is chosen to be minus 1. Therefore, for increasing n, dn will approach e to the minus 1, or 1 over e. So this is the sought after asymptotic value of the derangement probability. Let's zoom in on the region of interest to see how quickly the series converges for x equals minus 1, while the n values will be projected onto the y-axis. Pretty quickly, as you can see. At this scale, all noticeable changes occur up to n is about 6. Let's briefly return to the plot presented earlier and see how the obtained asymptotic value fits in. 1 over e has a decimal expansion of approximately 0.368. Adding in a few more data points illustrates how fast these values are closing in on the target. Here's the equivalent of this table in the Momors book. He's counted none derangements, because none derangements correspond to the definition of success in his game of Treze, and writes his results in terms of exact fractions. He uses p instead of n for the set size, a is the number of permutations for given p, and s the number of non-derangements.
For those of you seeking experimental verification of the result, here's a simulation of 10,000 random permutations for a set size of 20. Large enough for the theoretical probability of a derangement to be very close to 1 over e. As you can see, after some initial wanderings, the average proportion of derangements inescapably approaches 1 over e. As it should. Planet Earth, with a population pushing 8 billion in 2022. Imagine this entire population as an ordered set to be permuted. For n is 8 billion, the derangement fraction is unimaginably close to 1 over e. How close? Well, it's accurate to about 75 billion decimal places. Here we have the first 1000 of these 75 billion decimal digits. That means we could fill up 75 million more of those boxes before the decimals start to diverge from the expansion of 1 over e. So if you were to play Secret Santa with all the people on Earth, the odds that at least one person would miraculously draw his own name would not be that miraculous at all. In fact, that's what expected to happen nearly two out of three times, with probability 1 minus 1 over e, or about 63%. One of many examples where math seems to defy basic intuition. To offer a highly rewarding perspective instead, 